on this morning's Ag Issues program. As always, a pleasure to bring on to the program Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, as he joins us on the program this morning. Roger, good morning. How are you? Uh, good morning, Greg. Just doing fine today. Well, let's get right into it. Well, you know, I know there are many out there, if you're a farmer or ranching operation, maybe you're thinking about acquiring farm or ranch land, and uh, it's safe to say that there are many issues and considerations that arise. And so let me ask, what are, you know, what are some of the things, major concerns, uh, if you're thinking about acquiring some land or having a transaction like that? But I'm sure there are also the must-know things, must-know concepts if you're thinking about a land transaction? Well, when you mention um, existing operations or, or entities, um, I'll, let me throw one in there that I didn't uh, put in the piece that I recently published, and that is you've got to watch in certain parts of the country, particularly right down the center of the country, in Iowa in particular, you have to watch restrictions uh, on corporate farming uh, you know, corporate farming laws that are built in the code. And K Kansas actually had the very first anti-corporate farming statute in the country. Now, uh, there are certain restrictions on vertical inter inter integration, and there are restrictions on the ownership of agricultural land. And indeed, the Iowa statute probably has the most restrictions of any state in the country. But if you are a family entity or an authorized entity, uh, and you can be an LLC or an LLP or whatever the case might be, a family farm limited partnership or a family trust. They're not subject to restrictions on acquiring agricultural land. But um, I'll tell you what, we've seen a pretty hot uh, real estate market in northwest Iowa in, in recent days, um, recent months, let me put it that way. And we're seeing investors flow in. And you've got these big groups that will buy up land, but they don't farm it. They just cash lease it out. I would argue that that's a violation of the Iowa statute, which uh, says that your, your purpose of buying the land has to be to uh, uh, farm it uh, and own the land. Uh, and so if you're cash renting to a tenant, um, then you're, you're not farming and owning the land because farming means that you have Schedule F income. Um, IRS would not does not view a cash rental activity as a farming activity. So enforcement of that type of statute is up to the respective state attorney general. Um, but I can tell you in Iowa for years, they, they have shown absolutely no interest in enforcing the statute. So you see these major investors that get in there and they can outbid everybody else and it drives the price of land up. So that that's an issue that's there. Now, I did not write on that in the piece. What I'm writing on basically is um, an individual who's interested in buying farmland. Uh, maybe they have never done this before. Maybe the, somebody wants to get started in farming. What are some of those issues, uh, many of which we don't necessarily think about when we're interested in buying farmland? That, that was the focus of my recent piece. And, you know, buying agricultural land or production as well, uh, environmental related laws have um, been a big factor in all this as well and that is something that I you know if you're a potential buyer boy you, you definitely have to think about yeah you don't want to walk yourself into a, a liability situation based on environmental rules that are out there and, and the environmental restrictions and regulations have ramped up dramatically over the past 50 to 55 years uh, involving agriculture and agricultural land and Perhaps the most significant federal environmental rule, and the states ha each have their own version at the state level that kind of mirrors what's happening at the feds, uh, would be the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. And that's an act that focuses on hazardous waste sites. And so we don't normally think about that when it's the context of, of owning, buying and owning agricultural land, but it can have uh, significant relevance for ag operations because the term hazardous waste has been defined in the regulations and by the courts to include most pesticides and fertilizers and other chemicals that are commonly used on farms and ranches and its presence even after the owner who caused the presence of those chemicals and pesticides and herbicides to be there has left 
uh, the new owner can pick up liability because of that presence on that property. Um, so that's an issue that's out there. Now, there are defenses to liability, and we could spend a lot of time getting through that but uh, and discussing that. But basically what you need to do is you need to do uh, what's known as an all-appropriate inquiry about the environmental status of that land before you sign a purchase contract. Get that seller to make certain affirmations certain disclosures about what they know is on that property, uh, what they've done on that property during their term of ownership. And that is designed to try to give you some liability protection under the uh, CERCLA law uh, in case something crops up in the future and there is the presence of, uh, say, an old dump that's on the site or a waste disposal site that's been out of commission for a number of years. Those types of things need to be disclosed. So, you know, walking the property... Uh, asking questions, asking questions of neighbors, uh, those types of things can be very helpful to protect you from that type of environmental liability. And of course, there's a lot of public, publicly available information. Uh, that's where, wherever the land is, you can go through the county or uh, USDA as well. Yeah, there, there's more than just a uh, circle to be concerned about when you buy a farm. So there, get as much information about a particular tract that you can, and a lot of that can be uh, obtained publicly. You know, in this part of the country and east, um, you know, northeast Kansas has some drainage districts. There's one near Topeka. Uh, check the drainage district records on file at the county auditor's office. Uh, that's a good place to discover drainage information. Uh, that, that Those records may not be in the county register of deeds office or the recorder's office. It might be in the auditor's office. They won't show up in the abstract. And there may be private drainage agreements. There are also... Uh, you want to check uh, USDA and sub-agency records uh, about the land. That includes FSA and Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, records. Many sellers will choose to make all of those records open concerning a particular farm. So I think that's a good way to get access to USDA maps and documents. That'll allow you to determine if there's any government contracts or easements on the property involving government programs such as the CRP, the Wetlands Reserve Program, and that USDA and USDA information will also allow you as the buyer to determine if any of that land's highly erodible or has wetland status on it. And all of that can affect value uh, that you're going to pay for it. So this is not just informing yourself as to liability issues. The more information you have about the property, the better you are, the better you will know what the proper value of that is. And there's another factor too, uh, you know, if you're interested in buying farmland, uh, it probably would be good to know on whether uh, that particular piece of land is leased to a tenant. Oh, absolutely. This is one of these that can create all types of issues. Uh, in, in some states, long-term farm leases have to be recorded, and so you've got a public document there. Always check that. Check the publicly filed records. But most farm leases are short-term leases. Most of them are oral. And they automatically renew every year on the same terms and conditions uh, from year to year, unless notice to terminate has been given under state law. So having the seller sign a disclosure statement concerning the existence or non-existence of a crop lease or a mineral lease, because we've got those in Kansas, you can have a surface lease and a subsurface lease, or hunting leases or other type of land use agreement is a really good idea. Plus, those FSA records might reveal if government payments are being shared between the owner and a tenant or whether the payments attributable to that farm are being paid to someone other than the owner. The last thing that you want to have happen is some undisclosed tenant uh, that you thought when you bought a farm, you gave them notice to terminate because you do buy a farm subject to any existing lease agreements, regardless of what uh, real estate uh, realtors might tell you. They often do not get that correct. This, the land is sold subject to any existing lease. And the last thing you want is to have given notice to who you think the tenant is and then have an undisclosed tenant crop up. Uh, you know, if somebody, we've got a lot of these arrangements where there may be an elderly tenant and then they have uh, a family member actually farm it for them and they're splitting the government payments. Or they put somebody else's name on FSA, the tenant does, on FSA uh, program documentation so they can get an additional payment limit. Now, I'm not saying whether that's the right thing to do or whether that's not correct, but it happens. And so you don't want some undisclosed tenant to crop up at the last minute and claim, well, you didn't give me notice, and so I'm still here. 
So you got to check those things. And that, that can get particularly nasty if you get into a situation like that. So get that seller to disclose all potential tenants that might be out there, anybody that they've done business with uh, in terms of uh, leasing the property. That's a, that's a really important step. And, as, you know, that's a lot to consider, but uh, I'm sure there are a lot of other factors or other things that they probably need to consider as well. Yeah, get all the appropriate signatures. Uh, if the seller is married, get the spouse's signature. Determine whether that sale is part of any type of family settlement agreement. I mean, just kind of going down a list here of things that I've seen over the years that create problems. Um, make sure the legal description matches what you're buying. And uh, when you're using an abstract, uh, on that point, make sure the, you have legal counsel that brings that abstract up to date before the purchase and then ex- carefully examines it for accuracy and defects in title. Uh, now, the other thing to keep in mind, and I get this question quite a bit, well, I bought uh, a half section of land or I bought an 80 or, or I bought a quarter and really the I ended up you know, getting an acre or two short uh, of what the legal description says. Is that a, can I sue based on that? Well, generally, no, uh, because you may, because of the curvature of the earth, and uh, you may get you may have bought a track that is subject to a what's known as a correction line. The, the range lines on a survey will converge the farther north you go because of the Earth's curvature. So to keep those lines as parallel as possible and six miles apart uh, on the grid, the lines are laid out uh, for about 24 miles. Then a, cor- a correction line occurs so that the lines return to the normal six mile separation to. Rec- to keep that square shape of the township. So you've got these irregularities that are out there and you might end up buying a track that's on the correction line and you may lose uh, an acre or two here and there. That doesn't mean the legal description is bad. Uh, That legal description is sufficient if it either identifies the location of the land on the ground to the exclusion of all other land or gives you a means by which that location can be obtained from other sources. So you can't sue based on that. Uh, But just remember, the earth is is not flat, it's round. And uh, those that are old enough to remember, I grew up on Bugs Bunny cartoons, and there's that famous famous Bugs Bunny cartoon where he is Christopher Columbus, and he's arguing uh, that the the earth, uh, he's arguing with someone that the earth, they say the earth is flat. He says, no, she's round. And you go back and forth, you might remember that one. But that's a good point to remember the legal principle. There are curvature lines. Your legal description may not perfectly match. You can't normally sue based on that. Yes, the earth is flat as a pancake. One of the lines (laughs) in that cartoon as well. Hey, Mm -hmm. one other thing on that before we go to break. From the seller's perspective as well, uh, key information is one that you, you failure to do that of course, can cause issues or cancellation of sales, too. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, and it, basically, Greg, what it comes down to is getting as much information as you possibly can. Do so, Also do some common sense things. Go out and walk the property. Look at it. Check the fences out. Where are the fences located? Are they on the actual intended location or boundary? Are they on the surveyed line? If not, uh, what had been the prior practice of the adjoining landowners? Um, that, that's important. Look, look at the property for paths. That might give you evidence that, well, there's an access easement here. Somebody's using this path to get the machinery back to a field uh, or some other, some other purpose. Um, you want to know what type of usage of that property is there, how much of that land's being used by ditches and roads. Um, the seller's going to try to sell in accordance with deeded acres. But if you're going to farm it, uh, you're not interested necessarily in deeded acres. You want to pay for tillable ground. So make sure you understand the distinction between the two. I could go on and on, but we're going to run out of time. Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, joins us. And Roger, we got a case well, right here in Kansas, as a matter of fact. This has to do with uh, the potential of the removal of trees or vegetation at a rural intersection. Yeah, <clears throat> this is uh, also an issue that a lot of rural landowners are concerned about. Do I have a duty to trim or remove trees or vegetation at along a road or at a rural intersection that might be blocking the view for traffic? And the, the answer is, well, kind of depends, but probably not in, in Kansas. 
We had a, a really bad situation in Kansas a, a while back. There was a, a individual that died in a traffic accident at a rural intersection, and, and the estate, uh, after the decedent died, sued the landowner, saying, well, you had vegetation, trees, and brush, and so forth that overhang uh, into the visual area while you're on the road. And again, this is a rural rural roadway. And we've got case law on this in Kansas so for over 100 years. And basically the bottom line was that, no, the court in Kansas, and this is the Supreme Court in Kansas, said we're not going to apply, um, uh, impose a duty of reasonable care if the owner or possessor knows of the risk caused by natural conditions on the land or if the risk is obvious. Uh, we're not going to do that. And they also said, well, from a public policy standpoint, can, if Kansas uh, or in, in Kansas, if you've got tall crops or natural conditions that often obstruct the driver's view at a rural intersection, and you've got a lot of miles of property to maintain, you got a, it's just a huge project to maintain all of this. We're not going to put that duty on you. In, in other words, um, the statutory law in Kansas, the court said, puts the responsibility on the state or the local government to determine whether there's a traffic hazard that exists. So that would be your county road maintenance people, those types of things, townships and all of that. Now, they said a different rule might be appropriate in town uh, if you're if you're not um, uh, in a rural setting. And in this particular case, the facts were such that there was no indication, actually, that any part of the trees or overgrowth at issue extended outside the actual boundary of the defendant's property. And so that can be an issue. Now, if you do have vegetation that clearly is exceeding your property boundary, is clearly within the visual obstruction, yes, it's partly the responsibility of the county, the township, whatever the case might be, but it's your responsibility too. So that's the way I kind of read that case. You look at the particular facts of each situation. Is there an affirmative duty to trim that stuff back? Mm, Not really in rural settings, but it sure is a good idea to do that to keep yourself out of court. Well, one final thing to talk about, and this has to do with the Clean Water Act certification rules that uh, the court uh, that had talked about and recently uh, invalidated, too. Yeah, this continues to wind its way through numerous courts. Uh, Of course, back in 2020, the Trump administration wanted to streamline the permitting process for the Section 401 Clean Water Act uh, uh, permits. Uh, That's where you certify certain projects. Uh, And that rule had been in effect since 1971. Now, this is not the navigable water rule. This is a different one. There are multiple parts of the Clean Water Act that are being challenged. And so the Trump administration tried to streamline that permitting process for certain types of projects. Um, And uh, they wanted to have the EPA reconsider that old rule while keeping the new rule in place. So put a new rule in, go back and look at the old rule, try to get this all streamlined. And uh, basically what happened last month was that there was a federal district court out in California, the Northern District of California, that said, no, uh, 2020 rule is not going to be in place. Uh, uh, The 71 rule has been there for 50 years and uh, regulated parties could rely on it. So they invalidated the 2020 rule while the new rule was being rewritten. Um, because uh, businesses, landowners, whoever might be affected by this, have some consistency in knowing that rule, having worked with it for decades. And so they're going to rework that rule but not have the 2020 rule in place. All right, Roger, we're out of time, but as always, appreciate it. And we'll talk to you here in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Greg. That is Roger McCohen, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law as he joins us on the Ag Issues Program here on 580 WIBW.